All right, that's good enough. So, hello everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Woods. Uh, I am the product manager uh, for Amazon Web Services. I work in the realm of big data and high performance computing. These are our offices uh, back in South Lake Union in Seattle. Uh, before joining Amazon, uh, I was uh, running production software for the Human Genome Project over in the beautiful Greenfield site uh, just south of Cambridge in the UK. Uh, but that's what I do, it's not necessarily who I am. And to understand who I am, uh, you have to start looking and drilling into more of the data about me. Specifically, uh, I like to look at my own DNA. Uh, so I had my DNA sequenced, and if you look at my own DNA, you'll see that my muscles are composed to uh, enable me to sprint. You can probably tell. Uh, I also uh, have a typical risk of male pattern baldness. Uh, I have a genetic resistance to the norovirus, uh, which is handy. Uh, I have a increased caffeine consumption need. So on average, I drink uh, 0.25 cups uh, greater than the average coffee consumption each and every day. And uh, I also exhibit the photic sneeze reflex. Uh, so when I walk from dark to light rooms, I will sneeze. Uh, and I know all of this because uh, when you look at my bases in my human genome, uh, they line up as a string of about three different billion bases, uh, A's, T's, C's, and G's. And those A's, T's, C's, and G's get uh, translated uh, into, some transcribed into RNA. Uh, that RNA gets translated into a series of amino acids. Those series of amino acids fold into a unique three-dimensional conformational shape. And that three-dimensional conformational shape allows that protein to basically engage and interact uh, with other proteins to allow my muscles to be fast twitch so that I'm a sprinter, uh, to allow me to have a typical risk of male pattern baldness, uh, to allow me to be genetically resistant to the norovirus, and also to have an increased caffeine consumption at 0.25 cups per day over the average, and uh, also exhibit this photic sneeze reflex. And I know all of that because we worked on the human genome. Uh, this started about 20 years ago, and this allowed us to start looking at a comparison of data. So comparing species, whether it was human to uh, chimpanzee, chimpanzee to mouse, mouse to the duck-billed platypus, my all-time favorite genome, by the way. And this allowed us to identify areas of biological importance, because when you look at the data, areas of biological importance are conserved over the evolutionary tree. This is research which was really driven by data. This was a project which was all about data. And it gave us some resolution into the human condition uh, and how our cells work. It really laid the foundations. So this was work that was done driven by data, laying the foundations for modern biological research. About 10 years ago, seven to 10 years ago, there was a step change in how DNA sequencing was done. It basically allowed us to sequence genomes, to generate the data that's gonna drive this research forward in a much faster way and a much cheaper way. Uh, this is the machine that makes it happen. Uh, this is an Illumina sequencing instrument. Uh, you can see there that there's a PC connected to it. That's a username and password written on the post-it note there. Uh, if, you open up the, uh, if you open up the little gray slider, uh, you can see a glass slide. You put the DNA on that, run it through, shine a laser at it, it fluoresces at different wavelengths, and you can get an idea of this length of DNA that encodes, that programs my body to have all these different characteristics. This is the problem, and I'm sure this graph looks similar to many of you, irrespective of the domain in which you're working with. The cost per megabase of generating this data uh, is drive, dropping dramatically, and it's dropping way faster than Moore's law allows us to keep up. So we can't just rely on disks to get bigger and faster. We can't just rely on CPUs to be able to keep up to do this. We have to work in fundamentally and foundationally different ways. Uh, this will, should look familiar to you no matter what realm you're working in, right? So whether you're working in transcoding, whether you're looking at ad advertising click-through rates, whether you're customizing your websites for your customers, whether you're doing scientific and technical computing, these uh, data drivers, much like my sequencer back in Cambridge, are really causing this change to happen across different industries and for a wide, wide range of different projects. And what we end up with is this problem where we have more data, we have more uses for that data, uh, we have more users that want to take advantage of that data, either internally or externally, and we have more locations where people want to use that data. And each of these acts as a force multiplier in the complexity of managing and working with that data. Of course, the other cost force multiplier is the cost. You, know, you want this to be as low as possible. And this is really uh, where utility computing comes into the play, uh, where cloud computing can start to deliver services that can enable you to work with this data at pretty much any scale, whether you're at uh, the gigabyte, terabyte, or even petabyte scale. Being able to draw down computational resources and infrastructure resources uh, to be able to start addressing these problems without large capital expenditure up front. 
So what we're seeing is that really in all of these areas, these data-driven areas, whether it's startups using the data generated by that application to innovate quickly, to iterate quickly and pivot on their idea, or large scientific and technical uh, high-performance computing projects, a lot of these are being enabled by the cloud. And we have a great collection of customer speakers here joining us here today. We're very lucky uh, to be able to talk you through some of these use cases about how customers are working in these very data-driven environments to drive a lot of innovation in their projects uh, at pretty much all scales. So what they're doing is they're taking the foundations of uh, computer science where we're looking at using machine learning algorithms, we're looking at other traditional computer science approaches and scaling those up to deliver uh, additional value uh, to, this, uh, to these data-driven, these data-constrained, these data-intensive regions. So this allows customers to start to think uh, about how they can collect and store that data, how they can compute around that data, and how they can start to collaborate around the results of that computation. And that really is driving a huge amount of competitive advantage, as we'll see in some of our customer speakers today. Uh, they're able to use this data to find the signal, find that needle in the haystack, irrespective of the size or the complexity or the unstructuredness of the data. They're able to drive significant insight into their own customers, into their own businesses uh, moving forwards, and really find the pulse of their own business. So they can take their own projects, their own customers, uh, their own uh, business and their own organizations, and start to find out whether they have fast twitch muscles, whether they have this, this pattern of male pattern baldness, whether they are resistant to the norovirus, whether they have an increased uh, need for caffeine at 0.25 cups uh, every day over the average, and uh, whether they exhibit this photic sneeze reflex. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thanks, guys. So let's just jump back to the slides. I have one more thing, always. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through just the rest of the day and the rest of the agenda. Uh, so if we could just bring back up my slides just real quick. All right, perfect. Thanks, guys. Uh, so um, we're trying to be more green at these events. Uh, so uh, if you want to look at the agenda, uh, please just jump up onto awsevents.com. Uh, uh, we have uh, a really great um, uh, agenda coming up, uh, which, you'll, which you'll see on that, on that mobile-enabled site. Uh, so Adam Gray, uh, our product manager uh, for uh, Elastic MapReduce, is going to introduce a collection of speakers, Airbnb, MarketShare, and Capital IQ, to talk about how they're driving innovation using the data of their applications. Uh, then Deepak Singh, uh, principal product manager for EC2, is going to come up and talk to you a little bit about how customers are working in high-performance environments, so using tightly coupled services, uh, scale-out systems uh, across MIT, Bioproximity, and uh, Schrodinger. Uh, then we're going to have a quick break, and I welcome you all to talk to uh, some of our partners and some of our sponsors in the expo. I'm sure some of you saw it when you were having breakfast. And then we're going to be running a, a workshop, a hands-on session. So a lot of you have signed up for this already uh, at sign up. We saw such demand uh, for this workshop. We're actually going to give you uh, $100 of credit uh, to sit down and actually work with the platform. Uh, we have some work tutorials that you can run through. Uh, we've got AWS engineers to, to help guide you and answer any questions. And we saw such demand for that that we're going to run uh, a second workshop immediately afterwards. And you can sign up for that uh, at the registration desk. So if you want to join us, uh, spend those $100 on, uh, on working with the platform, getting your hands dirty with some of this data, you can join us uh, at 2.30, just register at uh, the registration desk. So we have uh, a wireless uh, that the key is out uh, on the tables outside. Uh, if you want to tweet about anything that we're saying, the hashtag uh, is AWS data. Uh, we also have the workshop, which is going to happen downstairs uh, at 12.30. Uh, please help us make these events better for you guys uh, by filling out the evaluation and the feedback forms, uh, which are again outside. And finally, I'd just like to thank our, our partners and our sponsors. Uh, this event really wouldn't be possible without them. So I'd like to thank uh, Think Big Analytics, uh, MarketShare, who are going to join us for a talk later on, uh, Cycle Computing, that are running a demo of their Cycle Cloud downstairs in the, in the foyer, Sumo Logic, and Karma Sphere as well. So thank you all very much to those guys. Uh, and with that, uh, I would very much like to welcome uh, our next speaker. Uh, John Rouser is the uh, principal uh, quantitative uh, analyst. Uh, a data scientist at Amazon Web Services. And so I'd very much like to welcome John up onto the stage now. John, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Yeah, so I'm John Rouser. As Matt said, uh, I'm a data scientist uh, at Amazon. And today I want to talk to you about what I think are some important changes that are happening in the way that we approach data processing problems. And the origin of this talk is uh, this question. 
Basically, we are very, very proud, uh, justifiably proud of the businesses uh, that our customers are building on top of AWS, and we talk a lot about those customers. But people would always ask us this question. They'd say, yeah, 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 but do you guys use AWS? Does Amazon run their business on top of AWS? And I always knew at some level that the answer to this question was yes, the teams all across the company were leveraging uh, AWS products, but in order to prepare for this talk, I needed details. So I went out and I interviewed a dozen teams scattered all across the company uh, about how they were using AWS services to tackle big data problems. And today I want to tell you about three of those teams. Um, the first one uh, I want to tell you about is the folks that run Amazon's Associates program. Um, so the, uh, the Associates program is actually one of our oldest marketing programs. The way it works is you put links to Amazon on your website. Uh, if people click on those links and they end up buying something, then we give you a share of that revenue. Um, and the folks that run the affiliates program, they have what seems like a pretty simple data processing problem, and that's deciding how much to pay each associate at the end of the month. Now, this is an extremely important problem, right? Money is going to be changing hands after all, so it's critical that we get this right. But still, it seems like a simple, pro uh, a simple problem. Maybe you could just write a single little program that ran on a single machine um, to solve this. Um, and that is exactly what we thought about 12 years ago when some engineer whose name is lost to history wrote a single threaded C++ application that connected directly to the production orders database every two hours and dumped out the orders that it was interested in to a series of flat files. And then another monolithic C++ application that ran once a month to scan over the daily aggregates and figure out how much to pay um, uh, people, uh, uh, or pardon me, uh, uh, no, to scan over the hourly aggregates uh, and, and come up with a daily aggregation. And then finally, another application that ran once a month to scan over the, 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 the hourly, uh, uh, the daily, geez, the daily files uh, and come up with a monthly picture, uh, which, is, uh, which we would then figure out how much to pay people, uh, at the appropriate rate, and we would send all that information off to the payment service, which is actually run by a completely separate team. Uh, and so the trouble is, is, is that this system ran very smoothly uh, until about 2008, when uh, this, this system in the middle here started to run out of memory. Now, as you can probably guess, the fourth quarter of every year, that's our busiest time of year, and so every year as Christmas time would approach, there'd be this flurry of engineering effort to get this system through just one more Q4. That was the rallying cry. Um, after which we would surely rewrite it. But you all know how that goes. I mean, who among us has not had this problem? You have some system that made perfect sense when you wrote it, but the scale of that problem has now outgrown the original design, and it is often very hard to make the call to scrap that original system and to rewrite. And in the case of data processing problems, there is often extra pressure to preserve that old monolithic application because once your problem grows beyond a single machine, now you have a distributed computing problem. And then you are in a whole new ballgame. So here's a whimsical little chart I made showing how hard a problem is to solve as a function of the number of machines that you need to solve it. Um, and let's say that the difficulty is one when you only need one machine. The instant you need more than one machine, the difficulty shoots up astronomically. Uh, and after that, the difficulty increases only slowly. Maybe it's a little bit harder when you need 50 nodes, a little bit harder yet when you need a few hundred nodes. But the huge change in difficulty comes at the transition from one to two. And so distributed computing is hard. And conceptually, it seems like it should be easy, right? I mean, the ideas that enable distributed computing, they've been floating around in academia for decades. Um, but actually implementing a distributed computing system that is both easy to operate and cheap, which means that it has to be fault tolerant so that it can run on inexpensive commodity hardware, implementing that kind of system requires godlike engineers, um, or at least it used to. And that brings me to the first innovation that I want to talk about today, and that's Hadoop. So the Apache Hadoop project simplifies a broad class of a distributed computing problems. And in case you're not familiar with Hadoop, what Hadoop is is it's the MapReduce computational paradigm implemented as an open source, fault-tolerant distributed system. 
And if you don't know about MapReduce, don't worry. For the purposes of this talk, all you need to know about MapReduce is that it is a way of expressing data processing problems in small steps that makes them very easy to distribute over a cluster of machines. Um, but MapReduce is just an idea, right? Uh, and what is really exciting about Hadoop is that it is a working implementation of that idea uh, 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 that is fault tolerant, which means that it can run on cheap commodity hardware. And so before when I said that distributed computing requires godlike engineers, that is no longer true, and that is the amazing innovation of Hadoop. With Hadoop, distributed computing only requires talented engineers. The godlike engineers that work on the Hadoop project, they have already done the really hard work of implementing a generalized distributed data processing system. And so remember our friends back in the Amazon Associates program, they have to figure out how much to pay each associate. Um, in 2010, they spent about eight engineering months getting this monolithic application through just one more Q4. They moved to a bigger host. Uh, they moved to a 64-bit operating system. They spent a lot of time optimizing memory usage and fixing memory leaks because it's C++ after all. Um, and it is totally understandable why they would do this if the alternative is to implement and then operate their own custom distributed data processing system. But earlier this year, they decided to re-express their problem in terms of simple map and reduce operations and to leverage the power of Hadoop. Here's what that looks like. There is a system that publishes the raw orders stream to a set of registered listeners. The associates team, they wrote an application that listens to that stream, it filters it, uh, it makes calls out to other services that it, uh, that it needs to talk to to get other metadata associated um, with the orders. Um, and then it stores all of that information into S3. And then there's a Hadoop cluster that wakes up every day and pulls 60 days worth of orders history out of S3. It adds up the month to date sales of every associate, it computes pay rates, and it stores all of that information back into S3. And then later on, other systems can come along, they can pick up that data, they can, uh, they can produce metrics, do reporting, make payments, you know, whatever they want. Um, today, this cluster is about 50 nodes, and that step of computing the total month-to-date sales of each associate ends up processing about 100 gigabytes of data, which takes about 30 minutes. And so now that they've made the leap to a distributed solution, larger and larger data sizes are no longer a problem, right? As they're, Volume grows, they don't have to scrape and to struggle each year to figure out how to continue fitting in memory on a single machine. All they have to do is add more machines to their cluster. The code that runs in the cluster doesn't change at all. And so just to review, up until a few years ago, the complexity curve for distributed computing looked like this, which meant that if your business grows faster than Moore's law, then the calculus of data is, well, if you've got more data, well, you'd better hire smarter engineers. But the innovation of Hadoop has changed that complexity curve, and now if you can find a way to express your problem in terms of map and reduce, then running on one machine is the same as running on two or 10 or 100. And the calculus becomes, well, if you've got more data, just get more boxes. And I think we can all agree that it's easier to rack computers than it is to hire smart engineers. And so, Hadoop is the first big innovation, and what it did is to lower the cost of developing distributed systems. But developing a system is only half of the picture. What about the cost of operating distributed systems? Let's look at that problem from the eyes, uh, or through the eyes of the Amazon Associates team. So here's a plot of traffic to Amazon.com over a typical November. Um, I actually used to work on the team that, that runs the, the, the front end web servers for Amazon's worldwide, re, uh, worldwide retail websites. Um, and we spent a lot of time in that team trying to figure out where to draw this red line. Uh, that red line is expected peak traffic plus a margin against forecast error. And you might wonder, if we scale the web server fleet uh, to that red line, how much of that capacity ends up going to waste? If you fire up Excel and you do the calculations, you get that during November, we would waste about three quarters of our available capacity. And this is true for the fleet that serves the Amazon.com website, as well as for any fleet whose traffic patterns are similar. And that is the case for the Hadoop cluster that computes payments for associates. Their inputs scale in exactly the same way as the Amazon.com website. 
And so there is this huge business opportunity if only we could find a way to scale our fleets dynamically. And that's where the second innovation comes in, surprise, surprise, utility computing, elastic computing, uh, or Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud in particular. So if you're here today, you probably know that Amazon EC2 provides resizable compute capacity in the cloud. That's what we say on our website. Uh, basically, you tell us how many machines you need. We give them to you a few minutes later. Uh, if you need more machines, hey, that's no problem. And when you're done with them, you just release them and we stop charging you. Um, uh, and it's important to point out that we did not purpose build EC2 to run our retail websites. We built EC2 as a general purpose utility computing platform for the internet. And we are very glad that we made that decision because that decision allowed us to build Elastic MapReduce, which is Apache Hadoop hosted on EC2. And our associates team, of course, they're not using uh, a sort of a vanilla physical Hadoop cluster. They're using Elastic MapReduce, um, which means that their cluster is easily resizable and their scaling model doesn't have to look like this anymore. They don't have to plan their capacity months in advance. They can scale their cluster according to the amount of traffic that they got that day. And it's really even better than that because they're using Elastic MapReduce and they store all of their aggregated results back into S3. When they're done processing for the day, they just release their hosts and then they don't get charged for them anymore. And so we see how EC2 lowers the cost of operating a distributed system. And we saw earlier how Hadoop lowers the cost of developing a distributed system. And when you combine these two innovations in Amazon Elastic MapReduce, you get what I think is a fundamental shift in the economics of data processing. Okay, another example, case study two. This one has to do with Amazon's fulfillment centers. Amazon has dozens of fulfillment centers all around the world. We shipped over nine million units on our peak day last year. Obviously, uh, problems of this scale present all kinds of interesting data-oriented problems, and item classification is one such problem. There are all kinds of reasons to classify items at the fulfillment centers, but the problem I want to talk about in more detail today is what we call high-risk value items. These are typically small, expensive items that are likely to go missing from fulfillment centers. And the classic example is a Kindle, right? Items like these we want to put into special high-security areas in the fulfillment center. Uh, uh, and the way that we have solved this problem historically is to use humans. Uh, you'd start with a manager at a fulfillment center poring over a pile of reports. They'd look at the reports and they'd uh, try to craft a set of rules that would cover the items they were seeing. Then they'd communicate those rules to an engineer who would turn them into a SQL statement that would get run against our data warehouse. Uh, and these are fairly gnarly SQL queries. So they take a while to run, but eventually we get a list of items that are deemed uh, high risk value, or HRV. Um, and the process of translating the human level rules into SQL is imprecise, and so that list actually needs to get checked again by the humans to make sure that it's right uh, before it finally gets sent off to systems that tell people where to store things in the fulfillment centers. And then, sometime later, the whole dance would begin again. And now, this system actually works pretty well in practice, but it has a couple of problems. And from an Amazon point of view, the obvious problem is that it involves highly skilled humans exercising sophisticated judgment. As our business continues to grow, as we have more and more fulfillment centers and more and more geographies and more and more lines of pro uh, uh, categories of product, then the smart humans are not going to be able to keep up. And so what we need is a system that can learn the characteristics of these high risk value items. Um, and the fulfillment center system team, they wrote such a system on top of Elastic MapReduce. Here's how that works. Um, we store the entire product catalog in S3, and there's a system that keeps that copy in S3 continuously up to date. And our total product catalog is over a billion items, but only a small fraction of those items change in any given week. And so to continuously reclassify just the updated items, the, uh, we spin up a small Elastic MapReduce cluster uh, uh, every 30 minutes. Currently, this cluster is just two nodes. Things get more interesting when we train new models and we want to reclassify on the whole catalog. For that, we spin up uh, a much larger cluster. We have to process over a billion items. Uh, and currently, when we reclassify the entire catalog for hazardous material status, we use a 50-node cluster, and it takes about two hours. 
And this ability to spin up clusters of vastly different size turns out to be really important. Imagine a world where you had a fixed size physical Hadoop cluster. Maybe we make it have five nodes because that's more than enough uh, uh, to handle the ongoing rate of updates. And when you have to reprocess the entire catalog, hey, that's no problem. You know, maybe it takes a really long time, but that's a batch process. That's an offline process. But now a clever engineer comes along and they have an idea for a new classification algorithm that will be more accurate. In order to test out that idea, the, that poor engineer has to, has to sit there and wait for however long it takes that fixed size physical cluster to grind through all those items. Basically, a physical cluster with a fixed size puts an artificial limit on creativity and innovation because innovation is fundamentally a process of punctuated equilibrium. Software systems typically undergo long periods of stasis until someone comes along with a new idea or until the problems they solve gain renewed urgency. It is impossible to predict this process, which means that you can't predict the scaling needs of your cluster. And so innovation on the schedule of the innovator is either tremendously expensive or impossible. And so this is another way in which the economics of data is changing. Because the Fulfillment Center Systems team uses Elastic MapReduce, they get to delay their scaling decisions until the last possible second, which lowers their cost of innovation. And any economist will tell you that if you lower the cost of doing something that people are already inclined to do, then they'll do more of it. And so we have more innovation with lower development costs and lower operational costs. And when you add all that up, you get, again, I argue, a fundamental shift in the economics of big data. And then there's that new phrase, that irritating new phrase, big data, right? What the heck is big data? Like, what does that even mean? You might actually have been wondering whether the things that I've been talking about so far are big data. Everything I've talked about so far is hundreds of gigabytes to perhaps a few terabytes. So is that actually big data? Yeah, I have an answer. Let's say that this is the distribution of data sizes. There are a large number of interesting and valuable data sets that you can comfortably process on a single machine. And then there's this large and growing number of data sets that you can't process on a single machine. And I think that all of these are properly called big data. But if you get all your information about, about big data from the popular press, then you could be forgiven for thinking that only this tiny little sliver of data, way, way, way out in the tail, the data sets that are measured in petabytes or in exabytes, only these things are big data. Um, but there is exciting stuff that is happening out there way, way, way in the tail, but these are not the most interesting data sets for reasons that I hope will become clear in just another minute. So remember this curve from the beginning of the talk. This shows what used to be the step change in difficulty as you cross from one machine to more than one machine, or I argue from small data to big data. This curve isn't quite the whole story. There's always some point where as your data grows, uh, that things start to get really, really difficult, like if you need an entire data center full of machines to process your data. And there's actually a third dimension, which is the value of mining the data set. And because it was so hard historically to extract value from large data sets, which remember, is anything bigger than will fit on a single machine, there were only a small number of data sets where the value outweighed the difficulty and it was worth building systems to extract that value. And because people think that only these enormous data sets way, way out here in the tail, these are the only thing that constitute the big data revolution, uh, that, that on, the, the only things that constitute big data, they think that the big data revolution is about shifting this spot where the difficulty shoots up to infinity and that all we're doing now is we're capturing this extra little sliver of value. But that is not the story at all. The real story is that the dual innovations of Hadoop and utility computing have dropped costs to the floor all up and down the spectrum, and this is the new opportunity that is at the heart of the big data revolution. There is tremendous value locked up in data sets that are just a bit too big to attack without distributed computing, but which historically weren't valuable enough to merit the incredible expense of developing and operating a custom distributed computing solution. And the valuable one, uh, 100 gigabyte data set is by far the more common case than the valuable one terabyte data set. 
And so with that in mind, let's look at what, from a big data perspective, might be the least interesting of my three case studies. So Cloud Drive. Cloud Drive is our product for personal storage in the cloud. You upload your documents, your photos, your music, really whatever you want. Uh, we store them on our servers. We allow you to securely access them from anywhere on the internet. Uh, one cool application that we've built on top of Cloud Drive is Cloud Player. Uh, if you buy your music on Amazon MP3 or you just upload your music to Cloud Drive, then you can play your music from anywhere on the internet, which I think is just a totally awesome application. Um, we launched Cloud Drive and Cloud Player in March of 2011, and one of the things that you need to build when you, uh, when you launch a new product is some sort of metric system. Um, and the Cloud Drive engineers, what they needed was they needed basic statistics, you know, the number of active users, the number of uploads, the number of downloads. And when, it, because they were building a metric system for a brand new service, they could have implemented that system as a single monolithic application that ran on a single machine. And they would have been forgiven if they had done exactly that, even though they would have been laying a little trap for their future selves because eventually their business would grow and it would outstrip that simple solution and they would have to scrap and rewrite. But the Cloud Drive engineers, they did something different. They chose to implement their metric system using Elastic MapReduce. Their architecture diagram looks like all the other ones I've shown you. There's a system that pumps their logs into S3. Every two hours, they spin up a small EMR cluster that aggregates their logs and stores the resulting metrics back into S3, where other processes can pick them up. And like before, when they're done processing, they just release the cluster and they don't have to pay for it anymore. And then if they dream up a new metric, uh, and they want to backfill it for all time, they just spin up an extra large cluster to reprocess all their historical data. And now all of this is exciting, but what I find really exciting is that the whole thing is about 3,000 lines of code. And now, when I first heard this number, I actually winced a little bit because 3,000 lines of code is not a trivial code base. But then I thought about it a little bit more, and I went and actually looked at the commit logs for their code, and they spent about two weeks developing those 3,000 lines. And then I realized that by implementing their metric system on top of Elastic MapReduce, they spent two weeks and they solved their metrics processing problem essentially forever. And that sounded like a pretty good trade. This is my favorite thing that anybody said in the dozen interviews that I did preparing for this talk. They said, log processing just isn't our business. Because their metrics system is, uh, or because their metrics problem is now solved forever, they are free to focus on building the best cloud-based personal storage solution that they possibly can. Um, they aren't spending their time worrying about scaling their metrics system. They're spending their time innovating on behalf of customers, which is exactly what we want them to be doing. And so when you think about big data, don't just think about this opportunity, exciting though it may be, but also ask yourself, how much time do you spend scaling data processing tasks that aren't your core business, and what else could you be doing with those resources? So here we are at the end of the talk. This is the question we started with. Does Amazon use AWS internally? And the answer is absolutely. Teams all across the company are leveraging both the basic infrastructure of utility computing as well as the, the, the applications that we have built on top of that infrastructure. Uh, and now I want to leave you with one final thought. Um, I talk to people all the time who are interested in Hadoop and, Meda and MapReduce and big data, and often I get a sense of angst from these people. You know, they, they feel like they should be doing something more with their data. Often they have really interesting ideas, but they have not been able to justify investing in, uh, in a physical cluster, a whole bunch of hardware, in order to see if it'll work. But when I talk to these people, I encourage them to give it a try with Elastic MapReduce. And what I tell them is that given the new economics of data that I've outlined today, and the impact that, that, that those economics will surely have on our industry, they can't afford not to. That's all I have, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, John. Um, so my name is Adam Gray, and I'm the product manager for Elastic MapReduce. And I want to talk about some ways in which AWS is simplifying the use of big data. And I'm really excited to invite up a couple of customers and a partner who are going to talk about how, in practice, they are using the solution. Um, but first, I really want to talk about what big data really is. 
and, and again, how to define it. Because um, you see, it really has become a loaded term. And, and I think the, the definition that I like the best is that big data is, is really when your data has hit a point which requires significant innovation just to handle the collection, the storage, the analysis, and the sharing of that data. Or put another way, it's when the data reaches a point in which you're no longer able to use traditional technologies to manage it. But then the next question, the obvious question is, why do we care? What is the value in big data? And the answer really is, shown over and over again across a number of industries, that it creates sustainable competitive advantage and a, and a significant amount of value. And we're going to dive into a couple different um, use cases and industries where you'll see that. But you look no farther than Facebook, a company about to have a $100 billion value by giving a product away for free, in essence, to buy your data and have access to that data and create that level of value. And the really thing with data is, is bigger really is better. Uh, many studies have been done. They've looked and seen for a large class of problems that if you had to choose between more sophisticated algorithms around that data or simply having more data, the larger amount of data wins virtually every time. And this is for a number of reasons that I won't get into, but it really smooths over um, errors in the data, smooths over um, anomalies, but also allows you to slice and dice that data in numerous different ways and still have statistical valuable um, results from that. So look at a couple customers in the way that they're really using large amounts of data in order to pull value out. We look at Yelp, who's a big AWS customer, who their ability to take millions and millions of searches allows them to determine what it is you're searching for, even if you don't know exactly what it's going to be or if you misspell it. So the ability, the more searches they pull in, the easier it is for them to make those determinations, but also easier for them to dive into things like what are the restaurants that you might want to go to, um, the theater you might want to, to visit, um, even the haircutting place you'd like to, to visit. The ability to pull in that data, especially here where it's very local based, the, the raw, uh, raw volume of data they pull in for, for a given location um, gives them significant advantages there. Jumping into another one in, in the ad tech space. Um, so digital advertising firm Razorfish. Their ability to take significant customer usage data um, allows them to provide more targeted ads. And a great example is a campaign, campaign they did with Best Buy, which they were able to take billions of customer impressions and working with them drive a 500% return on ad spend over a similar campaign the year before um, simply by bringing that data to bear. Uh, and the last one I'll talk about here is, is Etsy. Um, and they're the, the largest um, retailer of handmade goods. Uh, which is a really interesting space in big data because they have really the long, longest possible tail of items. When you're talking about selling um, unique baskets from a village in Africa, um, you, you can't get much more lo long tail than that. Um, and, and really one of the reasons people love to go to them is because they get great suggestions around very eclectic goods. So their ability to take customer purchase history and customer purchase data and, and use that to drive uh, meaningful recommendations drives huge, huge value. And the good, data, the good news is, um, around data, is, is yes, large amounts of data provide value, and data is absolutely exploding. Uh, I think the most interesting part of this graph, though, is it's looking at the unstructured data, where uh, IDC um, predicts that it's going to grow at a 62% average growth rate per year through 2014. Uh, unstructured data is absolutely exploding. And this is, this is data from, from logs. This is data from sensors. Um, this is social media data. Absolute explosion of this data. So, so the question really is, um, if data is growing at that rate and has so much value, why aren't more companies using it? And it really comes down to the three values of, of challenge, the three uh, Vs of challenges around data. So the volume of the data is one, the obvious one, but it's also the velocity. The speed in which that data is being generated and how quickly that data loses value if you're not able to pull, pull immediate insights from it. And then also the variety of data, the level of structure of data, the formats of it, um, the access patterns required to, to, to receive that data. All these things create real challenges. So I want to dive into what, what AWS provides to, to really um, support the four different um, processes required to handle big data. It was around the collection, the storage, the analysis, and the sharing of that data. First at the collection level, um, data is coming in from all different places. How do you get that into the cloud? Well, Amazon offers a number of different technologies for that. Um, starting from first, um, very low tech, 
you're actually able to ship through FedEx uh, disks to us to first get on. All the way to, to things like uh, Direct Connect, in which we'll create a physical connection from your data center into the public cloud. We're going to get very high bandwidth direct data flow back and forth. And continue down to the ability to stream data through open source technologies. Um, so that once the data has been collected, how do you store it? And one thing people will notice is they're looking through data. we are really seeing an explosion of different storage technologies that are available. And this is actually a good thing. It makes a lot of sense. Because there's a number of dimensions that define where your data should actually be placed. Um, it runs across the structure of that data, the size of that data, and the usage patterns around it. So just to look at a couple of these. Um, S3 is our cloud-based object store. Um, a great storage solution when you have unstructured data of very large size, uh, things like videos and binary files and, and images, things that you're gonna, going to process in their entirety, um, but you don't need very low latency access for those. Compare that to our NoSQL offering DynamoDB, which is perfect for small objects. They're gonna have very high write and read throughput rates. Um, things like the, uh, if, you're, if you're setting up for a, a mobile app, and have uh, customer usage data flowing through very quickly. Great solution for that. All the way to our typical um, schema-based, SQL-based solution, RDS. So big mixtures in the structure, or in the, in the data sources that are available. And from those, it brings some real challenges to try to analyze. Um, looking through, the typical data challenge. So let's say um, you're trying to improve how well you target information towards your customers. And, and you may store um, customer sign-up data or customer demographic data in a traditional relational store, maybe on-premise. Um, and then DynamoDB, you actually pull in all the transactional data from those customers, all the purchase history. And you want to combine those together in order to create this, this um, more targeted kind of ad model. There's no reason to stop there. Um, might as well pull in clickstream data from your customers that you store in S3, which has all the data about what they've done on your website. Pull in third-party data, things like social media data um, that you pull from APIs out of, say, Twitter or Facebook. And you see the complexity is increasing very quickly, but it goes even further than that. You're going to want to, along with creating those models, generate weekly and monthly reports. Well, what does this lead to? You end up with data from all different sources, very different formats, um, very different levels of structure, and, and, and very different volumes. How do you pull all those together and do it in an efficient way um, the answer is, as you probably have guessed, is, is, is Hadoop. Um, and as John did a great kind of initial overview into, is a great system for pulling in data across many different structures um, and really is schema agnostic. And at the same time, it lets you process that data in an efficient way, spreading the work across as many machines as you choose. Um, and Elastic MapReduce is our managed Hadoop service, which does a, a few really important things. So one, it reduces the complexity of setting Hadoop up, which as a nascent technology, there's still a lot of, a lot of complexities around it. Uh, it integrates seamlessly with other AWS services, making it easy, for example, to pull that data from Dynamo and from S3. And finally, it leverages a team who spent three years building and operating Hadoop systems, supporting both Amazon internally and external customers. And this is driving a number of different verticals. I'm going into too much detail here, but start with the initial um, kind of early adopters around advertising and social media, and now moving into things like life sciences and financial services. Um, and through this operational Hadoop experience, we've seen everything from university students to Fortune 50 companies using Hadoop, being able to see their usage in aggregate, and, and, and have moved to a point now where we have over a million clusters running per year, which has led us to be um, recently called the number one enterprise Hadoop solution um, by Forrester's report, um, speaking to um, one, the third parties that we work with directly, all the different storage services we work with, but also that operational experience. And finally, we offer a lot of integration with other AWS services. So things that come out of the box, things like our, our uh, CloudWatch, which is our cloud-based monitoring and alarming system, that lets you view cluster health, um, job progress, as well as a, alert on things like when clusters are idle and you should remove them to save money, um, as well as things like uh, when the contention on a cluster is, is at a certain point say 10 times the number of tasks to the number of available workers, you can automatically resize that cluster. And finally, we work with third-party tools. Karmasphere is a company used here as a partner. I offer a great tool that allows you to, through a graphical interface, um, handle data discovery, create visual, visually create queries, um, 
as well as uh, visualize the results from those. Um, and, and they also integrate directly with us, allowing them to have hourly pricing and work the same basic model that AWS works off of. So finally, I want to jump in real quickly on how you share that data. Uh, and this is a really interesting area that I think has, has a lot of room for extreme innovation and disruption. This is a fundamentally different problem space in which you try to view data at that scale and be able to do things like visualize it, explore it, and, and make decisions based on it. So first, let's look at Foursquare, one of our customers. A real interesting way to look at how their subscriptions over the period from 2009 to 2011 uh, moved across the world. Look over at one of my favorites, LinkedIn. You get things like how you look at how your connections, how they interrelate across a number of different, different areas. And finally, look at another one of our partners, MicroStrategy, who integrates right on top of EMR, allowing you to create dashboards to view data at that scale and make direct decisions off of it. Um, so, so lots of areas around the different pieces, um, around the collection, storage, and analysis, and then sharing of data that AWS is focused on. You'll see a lot more innovation there, both from us and our partners. Very exciting area, and, and uh, excited to bring up now one of our first customers here to talk about how they're actually doing this in practice. Topher Lin is a data engineer at Airbnb. Hi. So thanks a lot for the introduction. So my name is Topher. I work at Airbnb. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we use Amazon services to process our data. So first, uh, let me introduce a little bit Airbnb for those of you who aren't yet aware. Um, so Airbnb is an online marketplace for accommodation. Specifically, ordinary people rent out their spare rooms uh, for guests or travelers in order to stay. So as an example, this is my listing. I, rent, I used to live here. I used to rent out the couch for $30 a night. Uh, as a result, I earned about $500 a month, which really helped with my rent. Now I moved out, but I still keep the place, and I rent it out for $90 a night for the entire place. Uh, that pretty much pays off the rent for the entire place, earns me a few hundred bucks. Um, it's a really useful way for hosts with spare space to make some extra money. It's a really nice way for guests traveling to travel cheaply and to get a really nice local home, homely experience. Um, so what we provide is we provide a messaging platform that preserves the privacy of both parties and also a payments platform that handles the transaction, deals with refunds, offers customer support if anything ever goes awry. Um, so that's what we are. I want to talk a little bit about our growth. We started in 2008, um, took a long time for people to get used to the concept, but we hit 1 million guest nights booked in early 2011, and earlier this year we hit 5 million guest nights booked, so our growth is kind of crazy. Um, uh, one way to visualize this is in New York City. This is in 2008. These are all the blocks in Manhattan and you know other parts of New York that have Airbnbs on them. In 2009, we got a whole lot more. The lighter color means that there are a lot of listings on that block. And in 2010, you can see that there's pretty much an Airbnb on almost every block in Manhattan, which is truly incredible. You don't have to stay downtown in a particular hotel. You can be in any neighborhood that suits your purpose. Pretty awesome. Um, in addition to that, we have a social feature where you can see uh, when you search for a place to stay, you can see who's a friend of a friend. Um, and we do that through Facebook and Twitter connections. So we have a lot of data around that, 178 million social connections. So given all that data, we have a lot of hard problems to solve. Um, we think about them in terms of growth, search, product changes, fraud, and social problems. So in growth, the question is, uh, in what markets should we grow demand versus supply? For search, it's how do we rank these listings in order to optimize the experience for both guests and hosts? Uh, product, of course, every web application has that. How should we change the product? For fraud, uh, we want to find scammers and spammers and uh, unsafe people before they can act and hurt users. And in social, we want to understand the value of user social connections and leverage them to improve the product. So let's talk about data infrastructure a little bit. Um, we love Amazon Web Services in general. We use it EC2 for all our app hosting. We use a whole bunch of other services. Um, but the ones we like for data processing are S3, Elastic MapReduce, and DynamoDB. Um, we started our analytics with a single MySQL database that contained uh, all the searches and only a subset of the actual page impressions because we couldn't store that much data. We ran into a lot of problems with this. First of all, because we didn't store all the data, we just couldn't answer some questions. Uh, we had to just kind of 
infer proxy variables for some of the things we actually wanted to measure, like demand in a certain market. Moreover, it was really hard increasingly to join across different data sets. So for example, you want to usually join searches to a listing page views to understand how people converted off the search results page to actually looking at listings. But because the data sets were so large, it was extremely expensive to do these joins. So we ended up just aggregate, doing aggregate counts on each separate data set uh, within a market, which doesn't give you as good results. So um, this is becoming increasingly a problem. We get one million searches a day now and 10 million HTTP requests, all of which we would ideally like to log. So all of this was making our MySQL database very, very sad. Um, so we switched to a managed Hadoop cluster living on EC2, backed by EBS volumes underneath. Um, this was great. We got to store everything. Uh, we got a query over it. But there was a bunch of operational annoyances. In particular, because we grow so fast, we had to continually add capacity, um, add more instances, add more EBS volumes. Um, in addition, it was that last step in the top right, after we process all the data, we want to make it available for serving uh, to a web application, to a dashboard or something like that. And it was kind of hard to get data out of the cluster back into MySQL. Um, you know, we eventually worked out a solution, but it's still an extra step. It's a pain to deal with. Most importantly, this is all really, really expensive. You're running this cluster 24-7, and it's just, just, it just sucks. So we switched to Elastic MapReduce recently. Um, and the way this works now is we fire up a cluster when we need to run jobs. And what this buys us, first of all, in terms of log storage, is we have pretty much infinite capacity in S3. Uh, we don't have to worry about resizing the cluster in order to store any extra log data, which is really nice when your growth is exponential because you're continually growing faster than you can add capacity. Um, we then can process, fire up any number of machines we need to. And that takes care of a lot of our problems. We stream, we partic in particular stream data into S3 uh, in using gzip compression. So we get about 10 gigs of compressed data a day. Um, then we run all these queries. We use several interfaces. Um, if you're unfamiliar, pig, Hive is a way that you can write SQL, and the SQL essentially gets compiled down to a program that runs on Hadoop. So that's really useful because of a lot of our analysts were formerly using MySQL to do their processing. We just ported the queries over to uh, the particular flavor of SQL that Hive speaks. Um, final benefit was that because Amazon offers integration between Elastic MapReduce and DynamoDB, which is a key value store, uh, we could output the results directly into DynamoDB and automatically have a low latency data store that can serve web applications, which is extremely nice. We didn't have to worry about that extra step that might go wrong of moving data from Elastic MapReduce back into MySQL anymore. Um, one thing to note that I'd just like to point out is that we don't actually use the Elastic MapReduce client for submitting jobs. We have this thing we use called ARCs, which I think is really cool. You guys should check it out. One of our DevOps guys wrote it. It's a Haskell program that takes a bash script and any dependencies of the bash script in the local uh, machine's environment, packages them up into a binary and R-syncs it over the wire. And so you can essentially reproduce any relevant parts of this machine's environment on the remote machine where the binary needs to run. So you guys should check that out. It's on GitHub, github.com slash solid snack slash arcs. Um, so now we get to change the way we approach these problems. In growth, before we talked about where should we grow demand versus supply. When we didn't have search log data, we had to go on the occupancy rate of the market, i.e. what percentage of listings in San Francisco, for example, have a guest staying there at any given point. Um, the assumption is that if you have a low occupancy rate, you assume that demand is low for that market. But that's not actually true. It might be that a lot of people are searching, they're just not finding the types of places they want to stay in. Uh, with search log data, you can see what the actual demand is. Similarly, before we had a high occupancy rate, we would assume that you know, we were running out of supply. We needed to spend online marketing dollars to uh, get more people, more hosts onto the site. But actually now with the search data, we can understand if the market's actually saturated, i.e. like we have enough supply that matches the demand, and it's pretty much perfect. We have the ideal occupancy rate. For search before, it was pretty difficult to evaluate. We don't want to run experiments on new algorithms on the entire site, right? So we want to run uh, new search ranking algorithms on only a portion of the users. Um, but when you can't analyze large swaths of data, you have the problem of trying to figure out exactly whether the results of the experiment have to do with the ranking algorithm change or other incidental factors, like a special event occurring in a certain market that weekend, or just product changes that happen to be pushed out at the time. Um, when you 
with the ability to log all that search data and process it on Elastic MapReduce, we can now run experiments for longer, process all that data, we can do better uh, A-B testing to understand the impact of our ranking algorithm changes. Uh, with product before, we, it was largely qualitative. We have a really good user experience team, but there's only so far you can go with one-on-one -on -one interviews. So now we have behavioral data. We understand what filters are important to people when they search. We understand what their behavior is, from what pages they're most likely to go to the help section. And we can understand that these are the pages we need to make the most changes on in order to improve the user experience. Um, before, in terms of understanding the value of users and their relationships, we didn't really have a way to measure that. We only measured users' value based on the revenue they generated for us. But some people might actually be really valuable to the community um, through word of mouth and through their interaction with other hosts. So now we have the ability to process all those social connections that I was talking about. We get to understand that a user maybe did a booking in January, and then in February, a bunch of their Facebook friends signed up. So we should understand that this user is actually a fairly valuable user. Um, so that's what we have today. In terms of what's next, we're really interested in using Mesos, which is a new kind of cluster management framework for handling the scheduling of our jobs. We're also really excited about Spark, which is a, pro a project built on top of Mesos that allows you to hold distributed data sets in memory, which is really good for iterative algorithms, such as those used in machine learning. In Hadoop, you have to, like a little bit of you're your bottleneck usually on I.O. out of disk. So we're really excited about potentially using Spark to do really interesting stuff uh, and graph processing with our social graph. And finally, we'd like to do more stuff with visualization. Um, and we're excited about using JavaScript libraries like d3.js for this sort of thing. Uh, finally, the last thing I just want to touch on is you know, the whole point of why we do this data processing in the first place, right? Back to the whole idea that hosts and guests really benefit from the work that we do, matching them up, making sure they get time. This host is someone who um, lost her job. She was able to stay at home, raise her kids, spend time during the younger years because she was able to make money off of renting her spare room. And there are a lot of stories like this where people are unemployed, say, were able to save their mortgage and their home through renting out their space. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. Uh, if you want to work with us, I'm asked to point this out every time I speak, uh, airbnb.com slash jobs. And uh, now I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks. Hi, my name is Anupam Singh. Uh, I am the Vice President of Technology at MarketShare. And uh, we've heard a lot about Elastic Map Reduce today. We've heard a lot about Hadoop. Um, MarketShare is a company which uh, runs a marketing analytics application delivered as a software as a service on top of Amazon Web Services. And could we go back, please? Should. Sorry, uh, this thing, clicker seems to be going faster. Uh, all that fast data processing. So, uh, so, uh, so we're running these applications, and most of our customers are Fortune uh, 100 customers. They're accustomed to their enterprise applications being up all the time and uh, matching all the SLAs that they are accustomed to, right? So um, what we do is manage the entire pipeline. So we go from data to insights, data to applications. And uh, for some reason, this keeps going faster than expected. So uh, uh, what happens here is you have, a, a, you have a problem, which is you have to scale complex modeling. And customers don't realize this, but you have terabytes per customer. You have thousands of variables. And if you are uh, growing as market share is growing, you have 100 plus customers with 100 plus data sources. How do you manage this entire pipeline as an enterprise BI application? Let's look under the hood how it looks like. The first thing that happens is we get a lot of data. Now, big data, generally, people confuse it with terabytes, as, as John mentioned. But it's also the sheer number of sources that you have to manage. We have over 100 data sources pouring data into our data centers. So how do we manage that? So that's our first problem. OK, the client has FTP'd all the data. 
Now you as a company, meaning market share as a company or anybody else in data processing, has to do this very mundane job of ETL or terabytes of data. When we had one or two data sources, it was simple. Today, because we have 100 plus data sources, we are upwards of 100 stages uh, uh, running on this uh, platform. And then customers have never seen this data in a single dashboard, so we issue them as reports. Till here, it looks like a classic BI application. But after that comes the portion of modeling this data. We started as a data scientist company, so we have a lot of PhDs working through that data, trying to run equations, but now the number of equations have exploded. The number of, uh, of graphs that you have to explore has exploded. And all of this has to be now packaged as an application. Even though you have 30 data sources, 100 data sources, the customer just wants to look at a simple application and dial up and dial down on their marketing efficiency. So how do you do all this without breaking the bank? How do you scale across all this, right? How do you take many applications like marketing efficiency, attribution, dynamic pricing, and deploy them uh, 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 across these scaling dimensions? So let's look under the hood a little bit. So of course, we are here because uh, we, we love Amazon Web Services. We use almost every service uh, possible. Um, we run a stack uh, fronted by an elastic load balancer with apps running uh, a, a classic app server, and all our data processing is done on EC2 using Elastic MapReduce. That said, it's not as simple. Our first issue is, you know, everybody talks about Hadoop, everybody talks about data processing, Many of you might be actually experimenting with Hadoop right now. And you always start with a single cluster. And it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And interestingly, what we noticed was, even though our clusters got bigger, our users got more and more unhappy. How can that be? Hadoop was supposed to solve the distributed computing problem. Your users were supposed to be happy. What would happen is, the cluster would keep running into problems for very small uh, points of time. It would keep getting red for very small points of time. So what we realized was a single Hadoop cluster is not a good enough solution. It doesn't help you even though Hadoop has all this promise. So what do you do? To make your users happy, you divide it up across clusters, you take every one of your data sources or you take every one of your applications and you make the user happy by just isolating them. This is where Amazon EC2 is very useful because you can build any type of cluster that you wanted to. So we took our concerts data, put it on its own cluster. We took sports data, put it on its own cluster. Events, similarly. Okay, now you have happy users, but you have very, very unhappy operations engineers. If you run an actual application on Amazon and you start with a single cluster, I guarantee you that in two or three years, you might have 20, 30, 40 clusters. Because it's very easy to bring up a cluster. So your operations team is now faced with a bunch of people who have to manage these clusters. So if you're successful and if you're growing, you now start hiring operations engineers. But if you're the architect, you promised your CEO that operations cost will go down. How come you're hiring more operations engineer even though you have a virtual data center? It was supposed to go down, but you're hiring more and more operations engineer. So what we did was, we said, okay, these clusters have to be temporary. That's where Elastic MapReduce came in for us, where we added clusters only uh, as demanded and the number of operations engineers we had to hire to maintain these clusters went down uh, dramatically. From uh, 10 or 15 person operations team, it can go down to two if you use Amazon Elastic MapReduce. And then of course you can dial it up and dial it down. But our main benefit is reducing the operational cost of these clusters. Okay, you have all this, uh, 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 you know, you've solved the cluster proliferation issue. But what we realized was, as, as, as it has been mentioned, that distributed computing has become easier, but running operational data pipelines on these distributed computing clusters is not 
as easy as it sounds. It has become easier, yes, but it's not that easy. Because every day when data comes into your data center, you will see failures. And these are not failures because of the EC2 service. These are not failures because of Hadoop. These are failures because data inherently is dirty. Our customers will promise that the data is cleaned up from their ERP system. We bring it into our system, and it's actually crappy data. And you can't do anything about it. You can't blame the customer for sending bad data. So what we saw was jobs would fail again and again after completing 90 or 95%. And again, this meant that an operations engineer has to log into the system and understand why this job failed. So instead of that, we had to go in and firstly start building a very disciplined system of storing all our data on, uh, 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 on S3 so that we can go back and look at what failed, and also building failure resistance into our systems. Hadoop provides a lot of failure resistance. EC2 provides a lot of fa failure tolerance. But yet, you have to think about the, uh, the failure problems for your data pipeline yourself. You, you can't absolve yourself of that. So we invented technology to uh, uh, do restarts at a daily level. When data comes in daily, if there's a failure, how do you deal with that? So our message is that, yes, use Hadoop by all means, but try to do it in a multi-cluster environment. Don't bring up a single humongous Hadoop cluster. That won't be useful, at least as you, as you grow. Uh, if you do bring up uh, 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 elastic map reduce clusters, be careful about where you store the outputs so that you can restart uh, on failures. So that's, that's our message, having uh, worked on an operational data pipeline, bringing up SaaS applications for the last uh, three or four years on Amazon Web Services. Thank you. And I'll be around if you have any more questions. We are always uh, uh, willing to talk to prospective customers. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Jeff Sternberg. I'm from uh, S&P Capital IQ. Uh, we are a uh, leading financial information and analytics platform for investment banking, uh, private equity, hedge funds, investment managers, and other uh, financial professionals. So I'm going to start with a boring financial chart. Um, you know, pretty typical uh, kind of plot here. We've got a trend line over time. If we dig in, it gets a little, little less boring uh, when we add labels, right? So what we're looking at here is the cumulative transaction value um, of the IT sector over the last 10 years. Um, and this is investment in the IT sector. And, uh, and, and you can see that there's a, a little flattening in the 2008, 2009 time related to the recession. But overall, you know, we've actually uh, invested about $2.37 trillion dollars in investment techno in information technology over the last 10 years. So this actually uh, prompted me to wonder, you know, what about big data? Oh, and I should also point out that I was able to get these numbers from, from S&P Capital IQ transaction screening. So, um, you know, shameless plug there. So if we look at um, the last three years, I narrowed the time range down because, you know, big data is pretty recent. So let's look at just uh, the last three years uh, just with the IT sector. And, um, you know, pretty, pretty linear curve. Um, and we've got nearly $800 billion uh, invested in IT over the last three years. And then uh, what gets really interesting is if we look at just the big data investment over the same time period. Um, and, and the way I, I produced this, this data was by uh, uh, looking at... Uh, transactions um, for like M mergers and acquisitions, uh, venture capital, venture capital uh, private placements, et cetera, and, and looking, limiting specifically for the targets of those transactions, the companies um, of those transactions, and uh, limiting to the, uh, the keywords and the business descriptions of those companies. So looking for things like uh, data optimization, modeling, analytics, Hadoop, MapReduce, cloud storage, et cetera. Um, and there's a little bump at the end, then that's for Facebook. So that's exciting. All right, one more. There we go. 
Um, so if we look at the, uh, uh, you know, a, a little more analysis on this, um, what I wanted to do was actually uh, uh, look at the yearly growth rates of, this, of these two curves, right? We've got the, the investment in information technology curve and the investment in big data curve. And um, using the uh, quadratic equation, our friend from high school, um, we can uh, actually plot the yearly growth rate um, and find that we're, we're in a 23% growth rate for IT and about a 78% growth rate for big data. Um, and so, you know, if, if we project these curves out, um, the question becomes, you know, when will investment in big data catch up with IT? Um, and it, that turns out to be um, a little over uh, 10 year or a little under 10 years from, from three years ago. So by the end of the decade, you know, big data will be all IT and the two, the two things will be equal. And that's my prediction. Um, and here's the, uh, here's the growth rate um, plotted on a little curve just so you can see how that looks. So um, this prompted me to, to wonder, is, is, is big data big money? And I think, I think I was able to answer that with, uh, with those stats. So now I want to turn a little bit to um, uh, uh, something that we're doing at Capital IQ, which is pretty cool. Um, we're actually trying to, to use data to suggest more data. Um, and um, what we've built is a recommendation system, although we can't call it a recommendation system, um, because uh, we're, we're not a, an investment um, advice giving company, right? We're a sort of an unbiased financial data company. So, uh, but we do want to be able to suggest interesting um, company profiles or, uh, or, or data to our users, um, you know, that are looking at the Capital IQ website. Um, and, and we want to look, we want to do that by using the data exhaust, right? And I don't know if you guys have heard this term, but um, I think it's pretty apt, right? There's, you're clicking around a website and there's data coming, coming out the end of those clicks. And we can, we can actually leverage that data to, to make some pretty um, interesting things happen. And so um, we have some challenges when we do this, right? We're, we're an impartial data platform. So like I mentioned, we, uh, uh, we can't even call it a recommendation, right? We can't give you the buy, sell, hold kind of feel that, that the Wall Street guys want to do. Um, and uh, on top of that, you know, our clients are investment bankers or, or people who are working on Wall Street, and they're very secretive about their deals, right? They may have uh, confidentiality agreements with their, um, with their clients, and they don't want their usage to be um, even suggested to other uh, users. So that actually uh, makes it so that we can't use collaborative filtering um, at all. And, and if you guys know about collaborative filtering, it's a, it's a sort of a, a typical um, Recommend or recommendation um, algorithm. Um, so, but our advantage is that we have lots of great data, right? We have, um, you know, a, a bunch of booty in a, in a pirate's chest. Um, we have, in particular, this uh, this key developments data set um, that is really great. Uh, it's it's a curated news product. So we um, we basically sit on top of the news, and and our in-house researchers uh, make sure that we we link up the news correctly to the right companies. Um, and then do some, this, some event typing um, to, to assign categories to this news. And we actually uh, you know, provide this as a service in our product to allow um, uh, investors to kind of get smart on a company and, and, um, and understand the, the history of the company. Um, and here's just a, a quick screenshot of what that looks like for um, Facebook, again, our friends. Um, some recent events in their history. Uh, you can see some M&A transactions, some lawsuits, some uh, client announcements, and uh, you know, an SEC filing when they updated their, uh, their S1, their IPO registration. So um, we don't want to just use all key developments, right? Because even though they are, it's a high quality data set, we actually want to look for only the most interesting bits from this data set. And so the way we define interesting in this situation is, is uh, things that are popular uh, when they happen, but infrequently actually occur, right? So, you know, like winning at bingo, it's, a, it's an infrequent thing, um, and it's popular when it happens. So a good example in the financial world is, is a company announcing an increase to their dividend, um, which is way less common than companies uh, announcing that they affirm their dividend or they're keeping the same dividend rate. Um, and, uh, you know, we can roll that together into a pretty simple ratio to, to score, to help us score. Um, another important piece of our, our data is, is what we call user selectivity. 
Um, and for that, we're actually uh, looking at the profiles that users look at in the platform um, and categorizing that usage according to the sector or the, the industry that they look at. Um, uh, the region of the world where the company is located and the type of the company, whether it's private or public. Um, and uh, we can develop a profile per user based on their own click history to say, you know, um, it seems like you're interested in, you know, pharmaceutical companies uh, based in Canada or whatever. And uh, what we do is we actually score these suggestions um, for each user uh, uh, using Hadoop and Hive and, and of course, EMR. Um, and we have to remind ourselves to remove the items that the user has already seen, right? Because a suggestion is something something new. Um, and then we we put this in a little widget on the dashboard, um, which is a, a launch page in our platform, and uh, measure click-throughs, and you know iterate. Um, with any kind of uh, machine learning algorithm like this, you want to make sure that you look at what's happening um, and 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 kind of make tweaks as you go. Um, so this is the, the home page of, of S&P Capital IQ, uh, or rather my home page. Each user can customize it, but this is what it looks like for me. Um, and in here you can see the, the highlighted portion. That's the companies you may be interested in um, uh, data that we're, that we're suggesting. So here's a little uh, architectural diagram about how this works, right? Um, we actually store our click data um, maybe a little unusually in, in SQL, uh, in a SQL database. Um, this kind of dates back to the, the formation of our company. Um, we just decided to do that um, rather than having it in text logs. But the, the idea is similar. Um, we take data out of this relational data store uh, and, and upload it into Amazon S3. Um, and we're taking the click data as well as kind of that um, concrete, uh, you know, entity-based data, the, the key developments data and company profile data. Um, and then we're, we're launching an elastic map reduced job to compute the user selectivity, um, compute the key developments, scoring algorithms, join everything together, do a score, uh, and then emit data that we can store back in S3 and then round trip it back into our SQL databases so that our platform can, uh, can query it uh, dynamically. So just a, a little more uh, nuts and bolts on this. We're using uh, Microsoft SQL Server actually as our, as our data store, our main relational data store um, in our internal network. And so we use a, a Microsoft tool called BCP um, to export the data. Uh, we're using a, a command line application called S3 uh, to push data into S3. And then we're actually launching a 16 node uh, Hadoop cluster using Hive. Um, you know, obviously being SQL programmers, Hive is a, is a pretty good choice for us. Um, uh, it was low, uh, easy to get into doing the development. Um, and we control uh, this, this launching behavior with a, with a pretty simple Ruby script that has um, uh, some intelligence in it. We calculate the data, throw it back into S3 and BCPN. And thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Uh, I think that gives a, a really good introduction to the sort of uh, breadth uh, that we're seeing of uh, the Elastic MapReduce service. Everything from uh, using it uh, internally uh, on the Amazon retail side of the business all the way through to financial services and uh, startups uh, like Airbnb. Uh, so we're at the halfway point now. Uh, I'm going to welcome up on stage uh, our next speaker, uh, Deepak Singh, who is the principal product manager uh, for Amazon EC2. Deepak. Thank you. Uh, so today, I'd like to give you a brief insight about uh, what HPC with Amazon EC2 means. It's going to be a really fast train ride. I have only eight minutes. Uh, and, and I speak really fast anyway. So what do we think about HPC on EC2 and what it's all about? Or as I like to think about it, what is elastic cluster computing? Uh, you can think about it in many ways. I like to think about it like this. Uh, most people are used to infrastructure. People in the HPC space might be used to racks of computers sitting in a room with liquid cooling. If you've ever been in graduate school, you have a shared resource and you spend most of your time figuring out just how big your job needs to be to get time on a computing system. Within two weeks, sometimes it takes a little longer. If you're at a company, and I'll quote one of our partners who's out there, you need computing resources. Whenever you need them most, you don't have them, and most of the other time, you don't need them. Uh, so it's a, bit, it's, a, it's a little bit of a problem. So what do we do? To me, this is what an HPC infrastructure looks like, and it's generally true for EC2. It's an API. What do you do when you have an infrastructure that is fundamentally programmable, 
fundamentally elastic, and at a low cost. Well, you can do things like this. This is uh, a hedge fund uh, doing lots of modeling, rebuilding the models many times a day. They're an algorithmic trading company, they've rebuilt their models, and they come back, spin up anything from no instances to a thousand instances as required for their job. Companies like Cycle Computing take this even one step further. They spin up 30,000 core clusters uh, to end up with work at this kind of cost, $1,279 an hour in our spot market, to essentially be able to help a company like Novartis, which is what did this, be able to start uh, ordering compounds that they want to manufacture and test two weeks earlier than they would normally do. So this becomes unblocked by the fact that you're no longer waiting for resources. You can spin up multiple independent resources and get your work done faster. We make these resources available to you as what I call instance types. This is what I spend my day thinking about. Uh, instance types are resource mixes of CPU, memory, disk, network, and we give them to you in various sizes and families. With these instance, with these instance types, you can get great performance. Uh, companies like uh, Meta Markets, oh, go. There we go. You can get great performance with these. Companies like Meta Markets can do 40 instance clusters with you know, essentially a billion rows a second on just standard M2, two extra large clusters. But what do you do when you have workloads that require something like MPI, that are certain workload requirements on latency and bandwidth, uh, and certain dependencies that you have to control? So we took a step back, and what we did was come up with a new instance type. We call it the cluster compute instance. And we launched the first one in June of 2010, and what we did was we gave you eight Nehalem cores. Uh, we told you exactly what kind of cores you were running on. We exposed the CPU topology to you, and we also put all of this on a 10, gig 10 gigabit network. And the fun thing about this network was that we introduced the concept of a placement group. And what is a placement group? A placement group is nothing other than an uh, elastic, dynamic, full bisection bandwidth network. So every instance that you launch into this uh, network will have full 10 gigabit ba bandwidth between all nodes, regardless of what other nodes are doing, which is really cool and allows you to run an MPI job for all kinds of applications. Uh, like everybody else who does HPC, we ran Linpack. Uh, and we submitted our Linpack results to the top 500 competition. Uh, the first cluster we ran was about 7,000 cores, got 42 teraflops, and we ended up 231 on the November 2010 supercomputing list. And Linpack is a workload that works really well for, for the top 500 list, but there's other kinds of applications that you want to run. This is from the University of Washington. It's a crystallography spectroscopy application. In fact, what this group likes to do is they benchmark this application on our cluster instances, tuned it, and what it allows other groups in the world to do is run these same applications without having to own a supercomputing high-performance environment for very large-scale uh, spectroscopy problems, which is pretty neat. L uh, late last year, we, and one of the things we want to do with the HPC fleet is essentially t let customers take advantage of advances in processor architecture very quickly without having to turn around the infrastructure every 18 months or so, which is about as fast as the industry moves. So in November, we launched uh, a new instance called the Cluster Compute 28 Extra Large. Uh, it was based on Xeon E5-2670 processors, which, if you know your Intel release schedules, was not released at the time publicly. Uh, it ca came out in February. So since November, people have been able to spin up uh, HPC clusters on EC2 on Sandy Bridge processors. There's a beefy node, 16 cores, 32 with hyperthreads. And again, we ran Linpack. This time, it was a slightly larger cluster. And we got about 241 teraflops out of the 17,000 core cluster, which the perfect number for a geek, number 42 on the top 500 list. Uh, but it's not about the fact that you can run a 17,000 core cluster and be number 42. You can actually spin a 3,000 core cluster, which will also get you into the top 500 list, or at least would have in November. And you can spin up many of them concurrently, which is essentially the thing that makes uh, an elastic HPC environment and elastic cluster environment so useful. And one of the previous speakers kind of spoke to this by spinning up multiple concurrent environments. Um, but HPC is evolving. Uh, there's uh, different ways of doing high-performance computing. The one that we like uh, is something that we released in uh, November of 2010. And what we did was we took our cluster compute instance, uh, which you'll recognize, the cluster compute one, and we added two Tesla, NVIDIA Tesla cards in there for GPGPU computing. So you're essentially getting almost a teraflop of performance from a single compute node. And you can use this, you can use CUDA, which is NVIDIA's programming uh, model for doing programming and doing all kinds of interesting uh, general purpose computing things, or you can use the OpenCL library. So what kind of applications uh, can you do with this? And the second aspect of HPC is you need applications. Well, you can run things like uh, image processing from robots or spacecraft sitting in Mars. Uh, this is a workload that JPL runs where they process gigabits and terabits of images 
using our cluster framework. You can uh, be a quantitative diagnostic, molecular diagnostic company that's taking data from sequencers and trying to predict a result for some kind of diagnostic test. And this is an in, uh, architecture that Distributed Bio developed. Or you can do something in the energy space. This is a company in Brazil that tries to predict where they should buy their next uh, tranche of energy from, where they might want to build the next energy project, mostly in the renewable space. So you can do very complex mathematical problems using an elastic cluster infrastructure like that. Or this is, goes back to our physics example. You can just do research physics to do uh, for all kinds of experimental work. All of this information is found at aws.amazon.com uh, hpc. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me there. Uh, but in the end of this, we talked a lot, uh, I talked a lot about what infrastructure means, how you might want to use it. But in the end, this is why I like using elastic clusters, if it would go through. It's all about removing constraints. You can sit on a lake in Maine with a battery-powered generator, a MiFi, and start launching very large clusters as you want to get your work done, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce our uh, next uh, group of speakers. Uh, the first speaker we'll have is Justin Riley from MIT, who will talk about tools that allow scientists to spin up clusters. Uh, then we'll have Brian Bagley from Bioproximity, who talk, will talk about how, as a service provider, he benefits from having an elastic compute environment, a cluster environment to serve the needs of his customers. And finally, if you thought 30,000 cores was big, you'll hear from Alessandro Mongo from Schrodinger, who will talk about how you can try and find cancer drugs with massively distributed resources. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Um, my name is Justin Riley. I'm a software developer uh, for a group at MIT called the Software Tools for Academics and Researchers. Um, that's where STAR and uh, the name STAR Cluster comes from. Uh, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the work that we do and, and how it led to the creation of uh, STAR Cluster, which re really is a project that tries to put the power of Amazon's EC2 uh, centered around scientific research in the, in the hands of the everyday user. Um, so, in the beginning of this, uh, so our, our group in general works on, um, we, we try to work to, with faculty at MIT to help them bring research tools into the classroom. So we want to help them do innovative things uh, that, that uh, give students a little more uh, hands-on with some real-world applications instead of, uh, you know, toy problems. And so, uh, one of the faculty members that we worked to do this was Professor Marcus Bueller at MIT who had a uh, material simulation course. So he's teaching students about uh, modeling and simulating materials. And uh, when we first came into this, he kind of had students sitting down at uh, local machines and uh, typing in Unix commands. And um, long story short, very few number of students were actually able to do some of the demonstrations that he wanted to do in lectures, not to mention they needed to run this stuff for homework. Um, and so we ended up developing um, a system that allowed them to log in through a web interface and run this stuff on a cluster. And that was great, and it worked, it worked uh, really well. It beat, it beat having students do this stuff on their own. But at the end of the day, it put uh, the hard work constraint on us. So we had to figure out how to s scale this. If we had another professor who wanted to do this, how were we going to get the hardware to actually support these folks? Um, and and over more, or more, more so, we actually had problems with uh, you know, the size of the data that students were generating. Each of these runs that they were running were get many gigabytes big. Um, and so we were each year trying to, you know, buy enough hard drive space to, uh, to meet the max capacity. Um, and so we learned about uh, EC2. We ended up developing a solution where um, we would put this whole system on EC2. It allowed us to just call these things up uh, dynamically. We could uh, specify how many machines we wanted, how much disk space we needed, um, set up all of our applications, and um, we actually had a lot of success in that. And so when we built this system, we actually took a step back and said, well, what we've really created here is what a lot of folks use in, in research, right? So you have a, a number of machines with um, a queuing system, some parallel libraries, uh, your applications, and this is kind of a common problem that we've solved. So we decided to create a project called Start Cluster, which in general is um, a cluster computing toolkit for Amazon's EC2, and it's, uh, it's an open source project. Um, whoops. Can I go back one slide? I'm sorry. 
Right, okay. Uh, so anyhow, the, the goal of Star Cluster is to make it easy for anyone to get their hands on uh, computational resources. So if you're a faculty member, or you're a student, you're a researcher, um, and you maybe on your local cluster don't have enough uh, you know, spare resources for you to actually get your jobs through at the time, or you're in a crunch time and you really need some resources to do some extra computations, we built a tool that allows you to just easily install it, uh, put your con um, credentials in the config, run a simple command, spins everything up, and now you have access to a, a system that's very similar to what you would use in a research lab. Um, so the main goals are basically be easy to install, configure, um, easy to use, and by and large, lower you know, some of this complexity with uh, starting machines and, and dealing with the cloud. Um, and so you know, most of the applications we've had to date are you know, for scientific computing, um, you know, both in the classroom at, at MIT and in for research, um, distributed and parallel computing applications, and then uh, we also have folks who use this just for general infrastructure-related stuff. Um, so moving on, let's see. So the idea is that you know it's very easy to get started. You install Python; it's a Python-based tool. Easy install, start cluster. Put your credentials in the config. Um, there's you know you need to set up a key pair as well. It's another little detail, but then you run a simple command: start cluster start. You give your cluster a name. And then on the right, it'll stream a bunch of stuff by you. And when all that stuff com completes successfully, you have a working cluster that you can actually SSH into uh, and begin using. Uh, for folks who don't like the install process, you, uh, they've also created uh, Amazon, I believe with Matt uh, Wood, has created a CloudFormation template to where you can actually just do all of this from the web. And you can skip the Python install and all of that um, if, if you prefer just to take this thing for a quick test drive, which I think we'll do later uh, today. Um, so out of the box, what, the configuration that you get are, uh, li like I said, very similar to a, a research environment or a cluster environment in a research lab, which is user-friendly host names, things like master, node one, node two, um, passwordless SSH access between nodes, which enables things like MPI to work very smoothly. Uh, we have support for NFS sharing home directory, which is a common uh, setup in, in a lot of these places. Um, the ability to attach EBS volumes and share them across the cluster to all nodes. Uh, we link in ephemeral storage to, uh, for use for scratch base, and then we also give you a queuing system so you can submit jobs and, and actually distribute jobs over, uh, over the cluster. And so the AMIs that Star Cluster comes with include a lot of scientific libraries out of the box. So things like OpenMPI, uh, they automatically tune linear algebra subroutines that they're actually compiled against larger instance types so you, for performance. Um, and then other scientific libraries such as NumPy, SciPy, IPython, and, and, uh, and the likes. But an example workflow, so the basic idea is that you spin up a cluster. Um, the first line would start a 10-node cluster of spot instances with uh, M24x large instances. Um, we have a put command where you can upload your data directly to the instance. Obviously, you could use S3 or a number of other techniques. I'm just giving a simple workflow. Then you log in. Um, you know, run QSub, MPI run, whatever your application is that you need to kick things off. Uh, and then you have the ability to actually download results back from the instances. And at the end of the day, then you terminate whenever you're done. And so that will actually uh, stop billing. So that's just kind of a simple workflow for users who are first coming in the door. There's actually a lot more that's possible. Um, I mentioned here you can bootstrap clusters. So in addition to the defaults that I give you, right, you may want to do more. What about my application? I want to set up everything. Um, we have an API in Python that's very similar to something like Fabric or Chef, and actually you can integrate um, Fabric and Chef with Star Cluster via plugins. Um, and a few folks, I think, with BioTeam have done this before. But in general, this API allows you to, you know, programmatically control the nodes. You can re execute remote commands, get uh, read and write remote files as if they were local, so like local file descriptors in Python that represent remote uh, files. You can upload, download files to cluster nodes. Um, and then there's also additional hooks so that you'll see later you can add and remove uh, machines to these clusters, and these plugins will actually execute. So um, for example, we have it to where you know, new nodes will get ag added to the grid engine queue as a simple example. Um, as I mentioned, we also have spot support. We have a nice uh, command here that allows you to kind of quickly take a look at what's, what's the current spot price and the trends uh, of a particular instance type. It'll launch a browser, and you can interactively go in and see what, uh, what the data looks like and, and choose a, a spot bit accordingly. Um, obviously, we have the ability to uh, expand clusters. So if you find you need more resources, uh, more nodes at the end of the day, you can just call star cluster add node. You can actually pass other options to say add more than one node, but it'll do all of the uh, additional routines that are needed uh, to properly plug in a new instance into the cluster. And similarly, we have uh, remove node. You just tell it which one you want to zap out, and, and it properly detaches from all of these things and then uh, terminates the node. 
Um, and so one of the things that, uh, so that allows you to kind of write scripts, you know, if you want to actually uh, check, check something on the nodes and make a decision, oh, you know, maybe we're, uh, we don't have that much demand so we can, um, you know, cut out some of the nodes. And what we ended up doing was we were using Grid Engine to submit jobs when students would run things. And so we wrote uh, a load balancer uh, around SunGrid Engine that would actually check SunGrid Engine, see what the queue's like, and add and remove nodes as necessary. And so you can, this is kind of a simple example that we have in our docs, but um, you can see, you know, the number of hosts versus queue jobs kind of, uh, you know, they correlate a little bit there. So uh, meaning that, you know, as the number of queue jobs are up, it'll start adding nodes until the point that they come down and it removes them. So the whole elastic bit for SGE. Obviously, we have support for cluster compute and GPU for those folks uh, that are doing GPU-related work. Uh, includes the NVIDIA driver, the toolkit, OpenCL, PyOpenCL, PyCUDA, um, kind of all of the core tools um, that you would need to do GPU computing, uh, as well as things like Hadoop and uh, MPI um, and, and OpenGrid scheduler. And, all, and we also support Condor as well uh, as a scheduler. Um, so in the last few minutes, I wanted to just kind of talk about some exceptional examples of using Star Cluster for actually reproducible research. And this is a case from Titus Brown in uh, Michigan State who actually uh, took this paper that he wrote and created a GitHub repository that contained the paper, the, sci uh, the data routines, the, the, the pipelines that he was using, uh, as well as a snapshot for the data. And so he actually has instructions on how to completely reproduce the results of this paper using Star Cluster, which is a really cool thing. Um, and I think that's kind of a game-changing, um, a game-changing model, right? That 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 the cloud can actually, you know, the fact that we have AMIs that can encapsulate the OS and the libraries uh, and you know the bootstrapping, um, it's actually fully possible to completely, uh, you know, put this put the results in the hands of the user, which also allows them to investigate more. Um, we also have a similar example with uh, folks uh, from MyPython and um, the QIIME microbial ecology community, which I was a physicist uh, when I studied, so I'm, I'm not a microbial uh, expert. But in general, we were able to uh, create or to do the same type of thing. Um, I'm out of time. I have a really cool story about that. If you guys want to come talk to me afterwards, more than happy to do that. At this time, I'd like to uh, welcome the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the organizers for being letting me be here. Um, I'm Brian Bagley from Bioproximity. We're a contract research organization. Scientists send us their samples. We do shotgun proteomics on them so we can tell them what proteins are in their samples. Um, when we were getting started, we didn't have much more money than that needed to set up a lab and buy a mass spec. We certainly didn't have money to set up a high-performance compute cluster or to hire somebody to run it. So we looked into the AWS solutions and implemented that, and I'm going to um, go over my talk, why we need this, and how we've implemented it. So first, let me tell you what proteomics is. I think a lot of you might know what genomics is. It's gene sequencing. Proteomics is protein sequencing. Essentially, you're trying to look at all the pro proteins expressed in a cell or a tissue or what have you. The caterpillar and the butterfly have the same genome, different proteome. Same with the acorn and the oak tree. The genome is constant. The proteome changes over time. This is very important. The cells in your body, the liver, brain, skin, what have you, cells, they have their own specialized functions. They all have the same DNA complement you got from your parents, different proteomes expressed at different times. Of course, this manifests itself in disease. Somebody gets a disease, they get a biopsy. That biopsy is cut into very thin sections, mounted on a slide, stained. The pathologist looks at it under a microscope, like you see there in the upper uh, left. The cellular morphology that they're looking at is, to a large degree, the, uh, a function of the protein expression in those cells. In the recent decades have been able to focus in uh, a bit more on a single protein, as you see in the bottom right. That's one protein that they're staining for there. Shotgun proteomics lets you look at all the proteins expressed in these cells. So you can get a very clear picture of normal states, disease states, et cetera. So the 30-second tutorial and how shotgun proteomics works. You start with proteins, you cut them up with an enzyme into uh, fairly similarly sized pieces called peptides. You ionize them into the gas phase, they enter a mass spectrometer, the mass spectrometer measures the atomic masses of all these peptides all at once. And then it sequentially starts to fragment them to generate sequence information. You get fragmentation patterns like you see at the bottom. 
You go into your protein sequence library derived from your genome sequence library. Uh, you pull out peptides whose masses match what you uh, measured initially, and you look for theoretical fragmentation patterns that match your ex experimental fragmentation patterns. You sign scores and you put out a list of sequences that match, putatively match. So why high performance computing? One reason is that the sequencing speed of mass specs has been increasing over time about an order of magnitude over the past decade. This is more or less in line with Moore's law. But the real reason is that we're dealing with an astronomical search space. Um, and what people have done to deal with this is to essentially search the most narrow possible search space, which is the most likely con to contain the peptides that are indeed present. But you have this very long tail of peptides that you're not searching for that are present and they're just being missed because it hasn't been computationally tractable to look for them. So uh, something people have been doing is to just look, you know, that start bar there. They've been looking for the narrowest possible uh, set of peptides. And the next one, they're looking for decoys. They're doubling their search pace to get a false discovery rate. And the next one, you might want to look at the peptides that weren't perfectly cleaved, but form a very large background in your population. And the next one, you might want to look for phosphorylations, which are essentially on-off switches for proteins in the cell. And the next one, we've been doing a little side project looking at saliva proteome, certain individuals over time to see how they change, to see how oral health changes, see how disease burden changes, et cetera. Well, it turns out that your saliva contains a lot of bacteria, the oral microbiome. There are actually, at last count, about a thousand genomes of a uh, thousand bacteria present in your saliva. So that's a thousand more genomes you've got to search. And luckily, bacterial genomes aren't as large as human, but uh, it's still increasing your search space another 60-fold. So you're going, if you want to look at just these, just these uh, co very common parameters, you're going from a search space that might take a few hours on Amazon's best compute cluster instance to one that's going to take 30,000 hours. And that Amazon makes that computationally tractable, but uh, it's not quite cost effective for most use cases yet, I'm waiting for those costs to come to zero. But why the cloud? Uh, one reason, as the previous speaker was alluding to, is pr to promote open and reproducible science. It turns out if you send 30 different mass spec labs, the same sample, ask them to run the samples, process the data, and send it back, you're going to get back about 30 different results. Uh, if, on the other hand, you uh, process that data you get, they send you back by a centralized, uniform software pipeline, you get essentially the same results, which is encouraging. The mass spectrometrists know how to do mass spectrometry, not necessarily the computational side of it. Uh, another reason is that what we have now is a situation where mass spectrometrists generate their data, they run it through proprietary pipelines, you get proprietary outputs, maybe they put up the raw data in a central, in a public repository, it's increasingly done and it's great, but to be able to reproduce that data, if you don't have access to that proprietary pipeline, you just can't do it. You cannot confirm the data, you can't reproduce it, you can't really compare your data to theirs. So how should it be? In our view, you should be able to use open algorithms all the way around from converting the binary files that come off the mass spec to the searches to dealing with open uh, search result formats, et cetera, to your outputs. And users should be able to input and output, you know, upload and download those things at any point along this pipeline. So real quick, how does this work? This is what it looks like. This is the interface. The user has a list of files they've uploaded to upload more files. They just drag it onto the page and HTML5 uploader will put it up there. They select the files that they want to search. They select their search parameters or a set of search parameters. They select the number of nodes that they want to use and they click the launch button. And that's it, they've launched however many clusters they want, just like that. They look at how the searches are proceeding. They can see if they're finished, if they failed, what have you. They can click on any of these pull down the search results, look at their search logs, view the data in different viewers, and whatnot. So behind the scenes, this is what's happening. The user, of course, is on their, their local client. They upload to the web server. The web server's Excuse me. <laughs> the web server's running Ubuntu. It's the web application is Ruby on Rails based. Uh, it's an Nginx uh, web server, 
we've got a MySQL, uh, MySQL database that's basically just storing user information and the relationship of that user to their different inputs and outputs. Uh, Rescue does the queuing for the, for the clusters. They upload their data, it gets put off to uh, S3. S3 holds everything, the raw data, all the genome protein sequence libraries, search parameters, search outputs, all that stuff. When a cluster is called up, the server pulls whatever is necessary, the appropriate libraries, the appropriate inputs, et cetera, launches the cluster, it's EBS volume backed uh, clusters. Uh, there's a bunch of scripting that goes on to uh, convert the libraries into a proper binary format and whatnot. MPI does the uh, communication for the ser search algorithm between the nodes, and that's one of the reasons why we use the high performance uh, compute clusters because it runs very well on those 10 gig uh, interconnects there. It doesn't fail. Um, and then when the search is done, it goes back to the server, it's registered to the user, and gets put back to S3. And that's it. I'd like to thank, oh, and this is what it looks like, of course, when you've got a bunch of clusters running. Uh, looks good. Thank the people who have uh, contributed to this. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alessandro Monge um, from Schrodinger. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our virtual screening study on cycle computing's 50K core utility supercomponent on the Amazon cloud. Um, a little bit of introduction about Schrodinger. We are actually been around for a while. We're a 20-year-old company, and uh, we've been focused on innovation for uh, simulation of uh, biological and chemical systems to impact drug discovery. We were founded on a technological breakthrough in quantum mechanics, which resulted in our first product, Jaguar. Currently, we have a, a, about 160 employees, 60% of which are PhDs that are doing uh, scientific and software development. More than 50% of the company is dedicated to research and development, and so science is key to our success. Our mission is to advance computational drug design to the point of becoming a true enabling technology in drug discovery. Um, current investors are Bill Gates, who doesn't really need uh, any uh, background. Um, David Cho, um, uh, a lot of you might know, he um, was the founder of the um, DE Show and Company Hedge Fund, but most recently he has been actually developing a research group and he's the chief scientist of DE Show Research. Uh, we have offices around the world, um, so we serve a community of biotechs and uh, pharma companies in addition to research institutes and universities all over the world. Um, so again, here um, about 200 commercial customers, 800 academic institutions, and 50 government agencies. And here is a sample of some of the large companies, some biotechs, uh, um, not really represented well here in some universities. Um, so what we wanted to do was to actually uh, look at virtual screening. And the key technology that we use for virtual screening, it's called docking and we have a specific docking technology called Glide. It's a docking algorithm. What that means is that we take a small molecule, a small chemical compound, and we dock it into the uh, binding site of a receptor, as illustrated here. Um, in order to meet the demands of some of our customers, we need to screen lots and lots of compounds. Uh, we develop different modes of the docking algorithm. So we have a, a very fast uh, mode, which though is less accurate. We have an intermediate speed accuracy mode called SP, and then we have a slower, more uh, accurate mode called XP. So virtual screening really is um, a process by which you have a library of compounds uh, for a company, like a pharma company, could be the deck of their uh, compounds. 
And out of this, what you do, you generate compound conformation uh, that uh, are docked into the receptor here, sort of a, an illustration of all these compounds that are docked into the receptor binding site. And then you have to evaluate this conformation. So you have to evaluate the interaction with the receptors. They have to fit. Um, that's one part of the problem, but also have, they have to have good interactions. And um, the requirement that we had in this particular study was for a collaboration that Schrodinger is doing with a startup called Nimbus uh, uh, Therapeutics here in town. And the goal was really to be able to screen 21 million compounds against one receptor in the time frame of two to three hours. So what really the advantage of utility supercomputing was for us is that uh, in the past there was a trade-off between the compute time and the accuracy. So the process was to have an initial course screen um, and then um, we would select the top hits from there and then pass them on into a higher quality analysis and finally do the best quality. Now, um, time is obviously one of the um, uh, uh, metrics here, but it's very important that you uh, have the ability to do higher quality analysis more extensively and then do the best quality afterwards. So really what the attractiveness of utility supercomputing was for us, it was the ability to spread our net uh, much broader in such a way that we could actually evaluate, generate more confirmations of the compounds, and then evaluate them at a higher level of um, uh, accuracy. And so this automatically, right off the bat, uh, gives you the opportunity to reduce the number of false negatives in your process. Um, so here is some details. This was done, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, on a uh, cycle cluster running on the Amazon cloud. So uh, I, I think that the audience might find interesting some of this um, uh, uh, data that, that we have here. Uh, so uh, what we used and the, in terms of the scheduling, this was a particular challenge. Uh, Schrodinger, we have developed over the years you know, what we call job control. Um, it's a layer that it's used to distribute jobs um, on to multiple different clusters, but that obviously works very well for hundreds of cores, but not for um, an infrastructure like uh, a distributed environment on the cloud and, and a, a cycle cluster, which is really a bunch of a lot of clusters, as you'll see in a second. Um, and then there are other details. One thing that was very interesting is obviously the multi-region um, uh, aspect of the study. So. Um, here is, in fact, uh, some of the things that you recognize as uh, AWS users in terms of the instances that were used well, was, was very exciting. The ability to hit, you know, 6,000, almost 6,000 large instances uh, and we cover a bunch of different regions. So in the end, uh, what we were able to uh, achieve is um, this landmark of 50,000, over 50,000 cores for the run, which allowed us to uh, complete the screen in about three hours. Now, as a comparison, on a single core, that would have taken 20 million years. So, um, pretty insane. So, um, yes, here just, uh, I, I particularly like this because it gives the feeling of how global uh, this is and how is it possible to utilize resources across the, con uh, across the world. I think one interesting aspect that um, our partners and friends at Cycle tell us that you can be very clever about understanding you know, how utilization of the different uh, instances are across the regions. And I think that um, uh, the uh, uh, AWS people will probably provide at some point some algorithms running on their own infrastructure to help you be smart about where to choose uh, your resources. Um, so I really didn't want to uh, bore you with the details here, but for those interested, um, there is a, uh, m more details um, at the blog on the Cycle Computing Cloud uh, website. And in conclusion, uh, what the uh, 50,000 core glide study uh, run on the uh, Cycle Computing uh, cluster on the Amazon Cloud uh, represented for Schrodinger was really a proof of concept that we can start 
uh, attacking scientific problems uh, without being constrained by computational uh, resources. And um, we believe that this will be transformative in terms of our, uh, uh, the ability of our technology to impact um, drug discovery. Uh, we're very excited about the future and we look forward to giving you uh, updates on this, but this is all I have for you today. Okay. Well, I think that was a, a fantastic overview of some of the uh, work that our customers are doing in the, in the sort of big data and high performance space. Uh, not only would a single core uh, for uh, Alessandra's example have taken 20 million years uh, to compute the result, uh, but uh, Cycle and Schrodinger actually worked out that to build the infrastructure in order to be able to run that in three hours would have cost around $20 million. Uh, on the cloud, we charge them less than $5,000 an hour. Uh, so it really gives you a sense of uh, the removal of the constraints that we're seeing for customers that want to run uh, uh, computational workflows across data of pretty much any size. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to just round out. Uh, I want to thank all of our speakers uh, one last time, uh, and uh, thank you all for attending. I appreciate your busy people, and it's been a real privilege to have you join us today uh, to talk a little bit about uh, big data and high-performance computing. So thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks.